be jumping into is a, a, a kind of book level study going through the book of James. And I'm really excited about this study, and I kind of got all planned out, but I decided to call an audible, and we are actually going to start this series next week. Uh, and I felt like I needed to do a kind of a, a little quick kind of vision message this morning because something came up with the elders about a month ago. Something was off. Something felt wrong uh, or different. And, and there's just something just didn't feel right. We were just kind of sensing as an elder team. And I, it was like it almost felt normal. It almost felt like things were feeling normal here. And, uh, and, and so we kind of discerned that as, a, as an elder team, that I think the timing is right for, for us to kind of push the reset button and kind of go back to kind of where we were uh, pre-COVID. Now, I know we're tired of hearing about COVID, and I promise I was never going to mention it again. This is the last time I promise. Because <laughs> uh, we, you know, we talk about, you know, every church is still recovering from, from COVID. But I do want to just take a really quick moment and just remind ourselves what we have been through. I mean, COVID, it was just three years ago that everything shut down. That, that event that we all went through was, I believe, I'm pretty positive, it's, that was probably the greatest challenge the church in America has faced in our generation. Uh, not in other parts of the world. In other parts of the world, the church has faced worse crisis, persecution and such. But I think for the church in America, that, that, that was the greatest challenge that we faced. And so I was just kind of thinking back through what we have just been through. I was thinking back through the verse Easter's. Do you remember this? Easter 2020, we were in complete lockdown. We couldn't meet. Uh, we, we watched, the, you know, the video. We Zoomed together, you know, right after. Uh, Easter 2021, we were back here, but it was weird. I mean, we were, you know, we had this room. We were all spread out in little clusters of chairs in your bubble, just families together, uh, you know, wearing masks. I had one uh, person who's, you know, single, doesn't have a family. She would not come just because she didn't want to have to sit by herself. That, and that's just the reality that we kind of had to go through. There's still a lot of, uh, like, recovery that I think we're experiencing just from that uh, period of time. Uh, last year, Easter 2022, technically, it was back to normal. But it wasn't really. I've talked to other pastors, and we kind of all sense the same thing. We're back, but there's still kind of this, I don't know, like, this weird tentativeness, kind of, I guess, fragileness still of group dynamics a little bit. Where there's kind of like a just getting back to know each other. We, we hadn't been together in relationship, and, and sometimes trust kind of uh, takes a hit from that. And, and just so there was just, it still didn't feel like I could say, let's go. Let's go do outreach. Let's do, do this or that. There, there's still kind of a, a, a recovery period. And, and, but something is different now. I mean, I've sensed it. I've talked to the pastors. It, it, I, mean, I think it's just a relationship have been reengaged. There's, there's a sense of ready, being ready to move forward. I was talking to uh, last week uh, a pastor in town of one of the larger churches in town, probably the top three or four churches with attendance. We were just kind of agreeing, just kind of comparing notes a little bit. I've never had a really long conversation with this particular pastor and, and that yeah, how hard it was going through COVID. It just was, it was a really difficult thing. Um, and they're actually, um, they still are only, they have about half attendance of what they had pre-COVID, you know? So I feel pretty good. We're about 75, 80%. Uh, so that's, that's doing pretty, pretty good. Um, but we also both agreed, and he agreed that something feels different. It does feel like there's, there's, a, I mean, there's something more healthy, there's something more, you know, we, we went through really traumatic uh, uh, years together, and we're kind of coming out of that. So, so all that to say that kind of we feel as an elder team that it's really just time, we need to go back to 2019. Now, I hope that doesn't mean there's a pandemic just around the corner, uh, but, but back in just as far as our mentality, kind of our vision for doing the church, and, and really kind of back to uh, the model that we actually had uh, kind of in place for kinda a number of years, and it was growing, and things, there's some momentum, uh, challenges, but some, we're moving in a direction. I'll just remind us, here's what pre-COVID uh, 2019 looked like for us. We have always had a focus on these two-wing structures of the church. We, we worship together uh, at, well, now at Ocean 5, but 2019, we'd just been here for a little over a year. They opened in 2018, and the kind of whole, the plan was to, you know, we're going to build a community presence here at Ocean 5, and, you know, our, our attendance wasn't exploding, but it was healthy, and, and we had slow, steady growth, and, and so that was happening, and, and then, the, you know, as you know, a big passion for me is, is the small group wing, where, where we also worship together in small worshiping communities. We call them Life Together groups, and we got to the place where we had two-thirds of the entire church actively involved in a life together group, and that is a great number. I mean, most churches don't have that kind. Of, I, my goal 
my long-term goal is 75%, because you, you never have everybody uh, in small groups, but, but uh, so we were doing really well. I would meet, meet monthly with the group leaders, uh, uh, so, so that was happening. Um, but since COVID, we've really been in a recovery mode. You know, we, we've come back to meeting Ocean 5, and if you recall, you know, during COVID, we were all meeting as house churches for about a year, coming out of that, being able to move back. You know, I took a poll, uh, who wants to keep doing house church, and who wants to, us to come back to Ocean 5, and it was split 50-50. Half of you said, let's keep doing house church. Half of you said, no, we definitely want to come back to Ocean 5. So, wasn't going to split the church on that, so we came back to Ocean 5, really plugged in. I kept one house church going, so that was kind of a, the compromise uh, there, and really since then, though, all of the energy has really been placed on that large group wing, just getting back together, worshiping as a, as a church family uh, here at Ocean 5, and, uh, and just kind of, kind of growing that. And we still got a ways to go. We still got improvement to make, but I, I feel like we're, we're at a place now where, where we really need to focus on the small group wing again, because I've done nothing with a small group wing. I have not met with leaders. I've not tried to get Life Together groups going. Some of you guys are still meeting, uh, uh, and it's been a great support for you. Uh, but it's kind of like, I just haven't had the will to like say, let's do, until now, to let's go do Life Together groups. Because honestly, I'm just happy you even show up on Sunday sometimes, you know. It, it's just, it, there's just this kind of been that dynamic, but I don't feel that anymore. I don't feel that anymore, so I feel like we're at a place where we can really kind of go back to relaunching our two-wing vision of the church. And so, to do that, we're going to kind of temporarily bring all of our Life Together churches or groups to an end. We're going to actually end the house church. We're not going to do the house church anymore. We're just going to relaunch as just Life Together groups. But we're going to relaunch with the vision that we've originally had pre-COVID in 2019 of what that means. And so if you're newer, just if you're here for a long time, you've heard this spiel many times. But basically, we believe the church is a bird like two wings. And you need both wings to fly straight. You need the large group wing. You need the small group wing. If one is stronger than the other, you fly in circles. You need a healthy large group dynamic. You need a very healthy small group dynamic. Really, both are uh, really equally important, I believe. Uh, and so the large group wing is worshipped collectively here, corporately at, at Ocean 5. And then uh, as small groups and life together groups. I got a video about to come. You got ready for the audio? Uh, so, so we're going to just talk about life together groups this morning and the importance of, of life together Groups. Now, some of you, when you hear the term life together or just small groups, maybe that doesn't excite you. Maybe your response is something like this, guys. Are you tired of small groups always getting into your business, trying to get you to share your feelings, discuss your past, confess your sins? Are you just looking for a place to kick it, network, maybe get some free grub? Me too. That's why I created what I believe to be the world's first openly shallow small group. We're not here to deal with messy stuff like feelings and emotions. You got problems? You deal with that. You're an adult. Life ain't easy. So stop the pity party. We all have our issues. We don't really want to do life together. Frankly, at shallow small group, we try not to do much of anything at all. You'll never hear us use the term, unpack that thought. We're sure it's packed away for a really good reason. And you'll never hear us use the term accountability unless you're talking about someone who deals with numbers. Hey, dude, thanks for doing my taxes. You have great accountability. And spiritual growth. Who wants growth? I had a growth removed last week. It wasn't pleasant. There's no pressure here to remember each other's name. What's going on, buddy? Oh, hey, man. How's it going? That's good. Hey, Chief. Oh, dude. Captain, what's going on? We know you have a name, and that's the important thing. Group discussion? You got tickets to the big game? Sweet. Let's spend some time on that. Oh, you and your wife are struggling financially? There's tension in the relationship? Uh, that's not really the vibe we're going for. We avoid conflict like the plague. Who wants cake? Come on and get it! And there will never, ever be an awkward silence. That's our guarantee to you. We hate bad theology as much as the next guy, and we know the surest way to prevent bad theology is to avoid theology altogether. And outreach? This is the only outreach you'll ever have to do. Some people say we're superficial, but hey, the word supers and superficial. I mean, who doesn't want to be super? Shallow small group, because when things get too deep, people drown. Won't you join us?
So that's funny, but some of you kind of maybe have a, some a leeriness of, uh, of small groups and life together group ideas. So let's talk about why it's important. Why are we even emphasizing life together groups at One Hope Church? It really goes back to the beginning uh, when I've kind of, I mean, you already had some small groups, so you had a little bit of that dynamic too uh, already. But uh, when I came, I kind of landed on this verse. I remember the first few weeks I was even here, I, I, I kind of presented this verse as kind of a theme verse for our church. These are the four things the early church devoted to themselves to. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And I kind of took a message on each one. Well, this fellowship is one of the things that the early church devoted themselves to. But that word doesn't really mean what most of us think it means. Uh, when I think of the word fellowship, I think of just kind of fellowship hour at a church where you kind of hang out and talk to each other, small talk around the, uh, uh, the coffee uh, pot, which is fine. Actually, that's a good thing. That is a first step in really building relationships. So that's, that's part of what we're talking about here. But it's so much deeper than that, as I think most of you know. Uh, the Greek word for fellowship is actually the word koinonia, and it literally means sharing life together. In fact, Eugene Peterson, in his message translation, he translates this verse this way. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Uh, another maybe phrase that could kind of encapsulate that meaning of koinonia fellowship is the phrase authentic community. And I say authentic community because I probably some of you have experienced in a inauthentic community at churches at times. Uh, but we're talking about authentic community. And I think that here at One Hope, we have authentic community. And, and a lot of the authentic community here that has, is, has taken place is because even as the church formed, uh, you kind of went through a traumatic time even in the church forming. And, and you were, there were some tight bonds because you went through some things together. You birthed this church together. And, uh, and so, in fact, I think one of the reasons why we kind of made it through COVID is that there was a lot of relationship capital that I kind of built up during that time. And so I think there really is some really good, solid, authentic community in this church. But for those who are newer as they come in, you know, how, how do we really kind of get everybody to experience that authentic community? And, uh, and then also, our goal is to grow as a church, is it not? I mean, if, if we really want to people to come know Jesus and to get connected with the church, then that means we'll grow in numbers. And if we were to say become a church of three, 400 people, how does authentic community happen? And that how do you maintain authentic community? And the answer is some kind of small group ministry. Yay. <laughs> Now, I don't know what your response is to that phrase, small group ministry, but I hate it. I mean, I don't like that phrase. I don't like this idea of kind of here we're doing church and we got this, we got to do a small group ministry, keep people connected, and it's kind of this appendage to the church. And I, it's just, I don't know, it just rubs me the wrong way. And I ask myself the question, why is that? Why, why do I, I like that phrase, small group, small group ministry? And I think the reason is, is because it's not biblical. Look in the book of Acts. You will find nowhere any church that has a small group ministry. All you see is simply churches in small groups meeting in homes as the church and then meeting large as a large group for teaching time. That's what you see. Just take a look. This is God's design for the church. If you look through the book of Acts, you've got examples of small group church, we'll just call it, uh, churches meeting in the home. Acts 12, Peter gets released from prison. He, he went to the house of Mary where many people had gathered and were praying. They were pray gathered together as the church. Colossians 4, give my greeting to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Philemon, to Philemon and the church that meets in your home. Romans 16, greet Pris Priscilla and Quilla, greet also the church that meets at their house. Every time you see the word church, it's in the context of gathering together in the house. But you also see the church gathering as large groups. We see examples of large group church in Acts 5. They gathered at Solomon's Colonnade to hear the teachings of the apostles. In Acts 19, they rented out Tyrena, the school of Tyrenus Hall, Paul teaching at the, that school of Tyrenus Hall in Ephesus. But you notice in both those examples of other examples of gathering as the church, the word church is not even mentioned. You notice that? It's teaching. They, they gather for teaching. Now, I think it's church because anytime the body of Christ gathers, but you could almost make a case where you had small group church in homes and you had large group teaching in community spaces. That seems to be the model that we see in the early church. Uh, I won't push that. I'll just back off and just say, hey, you got small group church and you got large group church. 
And you need both. You need both wings. We need the small group wing. We need the large group wing. Uh, they, we, we need them both. But here's my challenge. And you don't have to agree with me, uh, but this is my absolute conviction. I would suggest that we see the small group as the basic Christian community and the large group worship service as the supplement to the small group authentic community church experience rather than the other way around. In other words, that rather than seeing that you know, we are a large group church and we have a small group ministry, that we would see ourselves, this is my vision, I would like to get to the point where we see ourselves that we are a church of small groups meeting in homes and we happen to have a really good large group ministry here at Ocean 5 that kind of supports that whole structure. And, and so that's kind of, uh, or, or maybe you just put it this way. Both are equally important. We need them both. But it, if life gets busy, you just can't do everything. And so you have a busy week, and you can't go to both. I can't go to Ocean 5 that morning and be a part of my Life Together group that week. If you have to drop one for the week, and you came and asked me, every single time I will say, don't go to Sunday morning. Go to your Life Together group. Because that's where relationships happen. That's where, uh, that's where community happens. Uh, uh, that, I believe, is, is the core of, of real church experience happens in that Life Together group, in that small group context. And why is that? Why the small group? I think there's lots of reasons. I'll give you five, though. Number one, <coughs> it's just harder to hide a non-existent faith in a small group gathering. Not impossible. It can be done, but it's harder. It's easy to kind of come into a bigger space like this and as a new person and kind of sit in the back and, and, and you kind of get to know people a little bit, uh, but you can kind of pick up on the language and begin to kind of talk the Christian, okay, I can, I can see how they talk, the Christian language, and, and you can get to the place where you, you no one, you, you never truly understood the gospel, you've never come to know Jesus, but nobody knows that because you've learned to talk the language in the large group context, there's those deeper relationships haven't taken place. And I'll give you an example of that. Before coming here as part of a house church in Buffalo, Minnesota, and uh, we teamed up to do Alpha with a Missouri Synod Lutheran church in town. And we did the, whole, the call it the Holy Spirit weekend. And at this weekend, uh, there's a time for prayer. And you come forward, and they kind of train you in Alpha to, to help someone. To, do they really know Jesus? Have they come to faith? And you do that by asking a question. If you were to die tonight, do you know that you would go to heaven? And it's kind of a good question just to kind of see where they're at. And, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and the next question is, why, why, why do you think that? And to kind of get a sense of that. Well, we had one of the elders at this Lutheran church, really good Lutheran church, know the pastors well, uh, was on the retreat. And so he came for the prayer because he, he was part of the team for Alpha. And we asked that question, if you were to die tonight, would you go to, do you know that you would go to heaven? And his response was, in all honesty, I, I hope so. And then we kind of asked why. Well, it was pretty much he'd been a, a pretty good person, and he'd been involved in church all his life, and he's an elder. You know, in other words, he didn't say because Jesus' blood shed on the cross for me, and and I, you know, that uh, I, he's the only reason. I, this was an elder, a leader of the church. Now I know that church; it's a good church. I know the pastors; they are solid pastors. If they had known that that's where he was at in, in his faith, they wouldn't have put him in the place of being an elder. But that's the point; they didn't know. There, there was no context. He, he just kind of kind of be a part of the large group. Now, had he been a part of a small worshiping community, a life together group, just you would just organically kind of begin to learn where people are at, and you can just gently kind of share with someone uh, the, the, the deeper parts of uh, the, the true meaning of the gospel. So it's harder, it's not impossible, but it's harder to hide a non-existent faith in a small group. Number two, the Bible just makes a lot more sense. I mean, if you look at every passage that talks about the church, and then if you have in your mind this, it does not make sense at all. But if you picture the church in a small worship community, it makes sense. I'll give you some examples. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul says, when you, what shall we say then, brothers? When you come together as the church, everyone has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. Shall we try that here? Okay, everybody's gotta have something. Now, Mark Hooper, you got a hymn, and uh, you got a scripture over here. If we were to do that, we'd be here all day, all night, if everybody kind of contributed. But in a small worshiping community, everybody can participate. Everybody can contribute in that context. Um, also, passages that talk about spiritual gifts used in the church, it makes a lot more sense in a small group community. I'll just give you one example. You got the gift of mercy. 
how do you use that here this morning? I don't know how you use that here this morning. But in a small group context, someone shares how they just, uh, you know, lost their job or they're going through some financial crisis. You got the gift of mercy. You just get out of your seat right during the worship service and you go over and you just, you put your arm around and you minister to them. That's the church happening in real time. The gifts of the Spirit just operate more in a, in a more uh, uh, effective way in that small group context. Or how about that passage where Jesus talks about church discipline? In Matthew 18, he talks about church discipline in the church. He says, if your brother sins, confront them just one-on-one in private. If they repent, great. But if they don't, take another brother with you and kind of confront them together. If they still don't repent, Jesus says, take it before the whole church. Where have you ever seen that happen? And would that even be appropriate to shame someone in, the, in a large group setting? But in a small worshiping community where you know each other, and you're in relationship, and you love each other, you can come around that person kind of like an intervention and really address that issue. I saw that happen years ago, uh, even before the, uh, years ago when our kids were like really little. We reached out to this this, uh, gal named Heather uh, and her her, uh, two kids living in an apartment, single mom. Um, You know, we, you know, led her to the Lord, baptized her for the first time, and she became part of our our life together. We we didn't call them life together groups, but part of our group our house church, and um, she had been a drug user. We thought she was clean, and she was clean for a bit, but she went back to using. We didn't know about it, found out that she had, and so as a house church, we did an intervention. Basically, we, we kind of gently, lovingly confronted her on that as, as at church in my living room, and, and long story short, God helped her get into a 12-step program, and she's doing great, but, but, but it just makes more sense in that small group context, so the Bible just makes a lot more sense. Uh, number three, evangelism just happens naturally. I have just found it's just a lot easier to invite someone to your home than to a church building if they're not a church person. A church, someone who's an established church person, yeah, they'll come to a, a church like this. But if, uh, if, they're, if an unchurched person or someone who has not been attending church for quite a while, it's easier to invite them to their home. When we were doing house church that year, I mean, do you know that uh, that year that we are doing house church, six, peop- six of you invited six family units or individuals to come, and they came, and they kept coming. I mean, that's, we actually were growing <laughs> for, for a while there during that year. And, uh, and so just evangelism happens naturally. Um, won't hit this one too much, but exponential growth is possible and manageable. Can you imagine, picture us, if I said, we're going to grow in two years from 75 people to, to uh, 150, and another two years, to th- we're going to double again to, to 300. We're going to have 300 people in four years. Well, that could happen, I suppose, but you're probably not. Uh, you know, it's hard to wrap your brain around that. But can you wrap your brain around eight people meeting in a home and doubling to 16 in two years? That's a little bit easier to grasp. How about 10 of those groups of eight doing that? You can kind of see how g- real uh, exponential growth can happen, but you're still in community. Nobody slips through the crack. But then the fifth and, and most important one is just the church is all about relationships. The church is all about relationships, relationships with Jesus and relationships uh, with one another. And, and so that's my, that's my spiel on Life Together groups. And so we're, gonna, we're basically going to reboot our Life Together groups, and I'm not expecting everybody to jump in on this right away. In fact, please don't, because we're, we're, we, uh, we're we're basically we're going to start with two groups. I think that as we, as we launch this, again, we're, we're ending our house church, Sunday night house church. We're temporarily pausing those of you who are in groups, but don't worry, we're going to launch you again, and you'll be in your same groups and with your, the people that you have. But I just want to put a pause so I can get us all together and get us back on the same page of what is a Life Together group and kind of raise the bar again of what we do because uh, th- these groups are not meant to be weekly meetings. They're, it's a family. It's church. And so... Uh, just logist, a few logistics here. Um, we'll start next Sunday, Sunday uh, the 23rd, and we're going to start with two groups. We're going to meet at the Hooper's house at 12.15. That'll be one. At, we'll meet at our house. Church is at 5, 5 p.m. Uh, Sandy and I are going to go to both groups and lead both groups for these first few weeks just to kind of set the tone and kind of kind of get us go, all going in the same direction. And um, I have a sign-up sheet on the table and that is purely logistical because we just want to know, have idea how many people are going to show up just for the sake of hosting. You're not signing your life away uh, or any of that. We're just tr- it, it's, think of it as a poll. We just need to get a sense of, of what we're looking at here as far as response as we get this going. But the idea is we're going to meet on, on Sunday, April 23rd, 
Then we're not going to meet the next Sunday because it's Dragon Boat. And I'm a big believer in weekly, you know, but it's, we're not a slave to that, so we're not going to do it for Dragon Boat. And then May 7th as well. We're going to meet May 7th in this way as well. And then we're just going to evaluate. And we'll see how many we have involved at that point. We may, at that point, multiply into three or four, you know, total groups. And we may be at, in that place for a bit. Um, what happens, especially for those of you who are newer to, one, to, uh, to this, um, I see generally five things I like to see happen. It doesn't have to have to happen the same way. Uh, you can do it in your own flavor as a small group, but I like to see these five things happen. Welcome, all that means is have fun. It needs to be a dynamic where you're eating dinner together. It's a welcoming environment. You're, there's laughter. When you do gather for, for your meeting-ish type thing, uh, you start with an icebreaker question. Number two, worship. That does not need to be singing. Some groups don't like to sing. It's really about inviting the presence of Jesus because this is church. Jesus makes ch uh, church church. And so if you don't, you, you might sing a song, but maybe you just open the Bible, read a psalm, and just invite the presence of Jesus into that space and, and just welcome them there. Bible, uh, there's some kind of Bible discussion time. It's not a Bible study. It's a Bible application time, discussion time, usually discussing the sermon from Sunday. Um, I'm going to do one new thing. This is an experiment. I found out uh, this last time because I've also been in our Tuesday Life Together group and I'd have the sermon questions. And on Tuesday at our Life Together group that we had going, I'd like... I don't remember what I preached on Sunday to answer these questions. I can't expect you guys to know those questions. So I'm going to start. By, I'm going to start making like a three-minute recap, kind of a three-minute summary, hitting the main bullet points, and those will be available. So uh, for a couple of reasons, then you can discuss uh, the, this the, and read the scripture text as well, and that helps all of us remember what what I even talked about or taught on. But also, it's because you're supposed to be inviting people into these groups, including people who are not part of one of church. Uh, so maybe you invite a neighbor. But if they at least get the kind of the summary and they get kind of the book, they, uh, they get the scripture, they can participate and not feel like they're left out of what's going on in that group. And then some kind of prayer component, pray for each other. And then vision is really just all about encouraging the group. We exist to reach out to others. These are not closed groups. Is this a closed group? No. Anybody can come to Ocean 5. These, this, this is church as well. They're not closed groups. Uh, and so they're really meant to invite people in. Another thing that makes this different than sm traditional small group ministry, kids and teens are absolutely welcome to these. these are, it's church. Of course they're welcome to church. Now, you may have some, some uh, tired parents who would like to have their kids stay home with a babysitter. That's totally fine. Get that. Been there. Uh, but in general, it's, these groups are so fun when there's little kids and teens. I mean, it's a little bit chaos sometimes, but it is so fun to do it in that dynamic. Um, each group has a leader and co-leader with the idea that once the groups uh, multiply into two groups, once they max out about 15 or 16, we don't rush that process. I don't control it. Uh, I help guide. I'll meet weekly with the leaders, uh, but it's, it's a process that takes place. It can take a couple years to do. So, uh, so that is kind of what happens. Uh, ultimately, though, this model only works to the degree that we really commit as a church to continue to grow as a relationship-building culture at One Hope Church. And that means that as, as, as with one another, but also as, we, as, you know, as we're in these groups and as we're building these groups, that your, your, your radar is always, as you see new folks, invite them to your group. Uh, invite them in. Uh, reach out to neighbors. Invite them into your, into your, your gathering. Hey, just try this out. You don't have to keep going if you don't like it. And, and so the church needs to be all about building relationships with one another, we all need this. We need to go back deeper, but also reaching out to others. Uh, you don't need to ask your group permission, can I invite somebody? I don't like that. You just, you invite. Tell the host, because, you know, just give them warning. Be, that's, we need to do that. But I want us to get to the place where that is our DNA. We're always looking out, how can we invite more and more people into these groups? So that's my spiel. If you'd like to sign up, you're free to do that in, as you guys leave. But honestly... Some of you are thinking this, this sounds good. I don't have the bandwidth right now. Fine. That's totally fine. A year from now, think about it a year from now or a year and a half from now. This is going to be a long process of rebuilding the health of our Life Together groups. It, it has, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. One final thing I'll just note, there is a Wednesday Zoom group that has been meeting and it's been a lifeline to some of our shut-ins and those who really can't come uh, regularly. Uh, and I'll say to the, to the live stream, we're not stopping 
the Zoom Wednesday group. So that online Zoom group, it will continue. Uh, we're not going to touch that. Thank you to Mark and Beth Jones for continuing to, to steward that. Appreciate that. So that's going to continue. And uh, so that is all I have to say about that. All right, let's do communion.